Hey guys, this is Mike Wolf. Welcome to the podcast. Today's conversation is with Awi Buzari, the chief science officer of a company called Pilot R&D and another company called Render. I had had a chance to meet Awi down at a CIA event and not the CIA that does international spying and espionage, but the Culinary Institute of America. I had went to Napa. Uh, they have an annual event called Rethink. I was actually a speaker at the event, but I also stayed and watched other speakers. And one of the speakers there was Ali, who talked during a session about food robotics. I really enjoyed Ali's presentation, in part because he talked about his experience with Creator, helping to bring that concept to market. I'm sure you've heard of it. Creator is this food robot restaurant making the perfect hamburger. And he talked about this idea of like actually making a hamburger that tasted better using robotics. And it was something that I was actually really intrigued by because, you know, when you think about food robotics, if you're like me, you're probably thinking about efficiency, um, lower labor costs, um, just being able to do things faster and not necessarily actually making better food. And so it was like a really interesting concept. So I thought I would bring Ali on the podcast to talk about that, among other things, because he's truly a renaissance man, has uh, has his fingers in a lot of pies, if you will. And so it was a really fun conversation. I, I think you'll enjoy it. Before we get started, uh, just real quickly, I'm just a little over a week away from heading to CES. Uh, I've been to so many CESs at this point, I've lost count. But this is actually the first CES that I'm actually doing a big event. Uh, the Spoon and the Smart Kitchen Summit is having uh, their Food Tech Live event. Uh, it's at, actually basically full. Uh, we're on wait list. If, if you're interested in it, you can just... Go to smartkitchensummit.com. Uh, if you make a really good case, we might actually have a, a space or two, but we're, we're pretty much at capacity. Um, but we will be there reporting and writing about some of these companies. We have 40 different companies coming to show interesting products, uh, some really interesting ones. We have companies like Selfie that print your face on cookies. We have Breville coming with their pizza, uh, smart pizza oven. It's uh, making like tons of pizzas, so it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're, if you're going to be at CS, I'd love to connect with you. Uh, just tweet at me at Michael Wolf or direct message me. Also, just follow The Spoon at thespoon.tech. We will be writing and, and reporting from uh, The Spoon. We actually have the whole crew going, uh, pretty much the whole crew. We have uh, Catherine. We have Chris going. We have also our videographer, Josh, going, uh, myself. Um, yeah, so check us out. We hope to have some great stories from Vegas. Other than that, I hope everyone has a great new year. I uh, hope everyone had a great holidays, and uh, we have a lot of exciting things planned for next year, and I hope to see you at The Spoon. So so keep checking in on us, and we'll see you all in 2019. <music> Hey, well, I'm super excited to have Ali Buzari on the podcast today. How you doing, Ali? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. You're one of these guys that seems like you have your your toes in a lot of different waters. <laughs> You're doing lots of different things. We had a chance, and we'll, we're going to get into all those, by the way. Uh, but you run a company called Pilot R&D. You also run a company called Render. You have this uh, book you published called Ingredient. All fascinating, um, and we're going to dive into that. But we met at the CIA event a couple months ago where you are talking about food robots and I want yeah. to talk a little bit about food robots. Let's talk about food robots. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, bad, and ugly. Uh, I had a chance to catch your session, was which was at the end with a, a few other crazy uh, food robot people. And I actually wrote an article about it because it was this idea that – because when I think about food robots oftentimes, I'm oftentimes centered in my thinking around efficiency, you know, lower cost, et cetera. But you kind of explored this idea of like maybe how food robots can actually – Help us taste tastes and create foods that we haven't haven't tried before and do unique things. Yeah. Um, I mean, frankly, for my background and, and for uh, my partners at Pilot, like we're probably only going to be interested in a robotics idea if there's better food at the end of it. Um, I, I think just my, my background is as a chef and um, I, I'm not as wooed by the flashy – gadgetry of the idea of robotics i'm not wooed enough by it to really buy into something that doesn't end up tasting really excellent at the end of the day so yeah the session um at that conference uh primarily centered around an amazing project that we did um with a company called creator 
um, yep. who they have a fully automated hamburger restaurant in San Francisco. And um, which is amazing to look at, by the way, the the, the visual of Creator is just it is cool. like very like Nordic design, sexy yeah. look at yeah. <laughs> it's it's re- it's really a, a pretty machine. But um, when they approached us, the first thing that they said was, we have a chance to make a better fast casual burger than is physically or financially possible uh, with the types of cooks and the types of business models that you can have um, uh, with a traditional setup. And we said, okay, cool, go on. Um, And they started telling us about how they could do things with how the meat was prepared and marinated. They could do things with how sauces were were dispensed. They could um, uh, do things for customizing the assembly and the stacking of ingredients on a burger, Um, not to mention the like truly a la minute timing. Um, They could do all of these things that would eventually end up leading to a burger that tasted better than uh, you could have uh, any kind of any other way in in that kind of restaurant. Yeah, and you know when you think about the way you have to make a burger in terms of the economy of the the ingredients and the economy of the time you have for people who are sitting there hungry, um, and if you want to do a fresh in the restaurant, like you can only do so much. And I think that kind of the thesis of what you talked about was there was just things you could do with uh, a robotic assistant. Uh, of creating the food down to the minuteness of like actually the weaving of the ground beef that you just couldn't do in a normal scenario uh, just because if you're talking about something like a red robin or like that you just can't you don't have the time or the expertise yeah there's there's just not the precision um and we chatted with these guys a lot about techniques that we were implementing um my, my partners and i when we were um consulting and, and doing r d for three michelin star restaurants and we were talking about all, a lot of these things of um, how how sauces are applied to a sandwich by chefs who are really, really mindful and by people who are just um, kind of rocking a squeeze bottle um, and the differences in in uh, in taste, texture, aroma, visual appeal, everything that you could get if you had just more control. And apart from the more control thing, the other thing that was really interesting – uh, was that they claimed that this model would allow them uh, to invest a lot more money in food cost. Um, food cost for your typical like fast food burger is usually less than a dollar. It's usually cents. Um, and their the premise was by making this more efficient system, we could put like actual brisket into a hamburger. Um, we 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 could. Uh, raise that um, food budget for the food um, pretty pretty intensely. That's pretty interesting. And, I, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. I, but you know, I, we just uncovered um, the patent that Spice was awarded this week. Um, uh-huh. You know Spice on the East Coast. They do that robotic restaurant. And one of the kind of the main concepts they were pushing is – and they were really talking about this idea you're talking about where fast casual, fast food, uh, and in, a disproportionate amount of the money goes into labor – and which causes these franchises and chains to really lower their ingredient costs and, and deliver a subpar <laughs> bill of materials, put in the tech mm-hmm. terms. Mm-hmm. And they, they felt that if you can use some level of automation, it can actually allow you to use better ingredients. Absolutely. And and that was the thesis. Um, that was the way it was executed. I, I don't know. We, we, uh, we, we run uh, a consulting company out of the Bay Area. So we hear – all kinds of very business tech and marketing first kind of ideas where you, you kind of squint and look at it and be like, all right, I, I, I guess good food could come out of this idea. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, tangentially. Um, but with the folks at creator, it was instantly, Oh man, this is, this is the real deal. This is, these are people who care about m- making stuff tasty, uh, rather than making things buzz and whir and levitate. So when you think of robotics, I, I heard you really hone in on this idea of like how higher precision can deliver a better quality product. And, you know, this idea of like just high precision in cooking um, and kind of has really been this at the forefront, I think, of a lot of the culinary exploration around things like sous vide, et cetera, over the past decade. And yeah. you just feel like robotics is another tool in the toolbox to just create greater precision. Uh, yeah, it, it can be. It can also be really stupid. <laughs> right. right. Um, I think uh, so. So 
coming into this world, the, the cooking world um, is very nostalgic. It's very sentimental and it can have some very traditionalist tendencies. And so anytime you talk about bringing something into this world that changes the role of a human holding a spoon in front of a stove, people get very touchy. Um, I, I, one of my first experiences, uh, I, I used to right. teach at the CIA. I went around and introduced myself to all the faculty members when I first got there. And about half of them said, yeah, man, just so you know, I'm not, I don't do sous vide or, or any of that fancy stuff. I don't <laughs> that want was like, that was part of their intro. Just get that, that out of the way. No, I'm, I, I'm not exaggerating. That was, <laughs> that was part of the, cause they, they, I was, I was being carted around and introduced as like the science guy. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 the, the, the science of roasting a chicken in a, over a wood hearth in the middle of the wilderness is the same as the science of uh, doing a bunch of sous vide centrifuge, uh, you know, nonsense. And so, um, with, with just introducing sous vide cooking where the, the only premise was, Hey, you're actually going to know what temperature you're cooking at. There, there was this incredible onslaught of chefy think pieces about how we're selling our soul. We're losing that, that fine tuned, uh, chef instinct and all that stuff. And I tell you what, if that were true and sous vide cooking were just plug and play, um, I would not have had uh, the two or three dozen terrible sous vide products that I've had over the past couple of years. Um, and we won't it, name names on that. No, I mean, it, it, <laughs> sometimes it was just at restaurants, yeah, yeah. you know, really oh, weird, yeah. flabby uh, chicken that was cooked at 140 uh, Fahrenheit be- because they could. Um, and uh, – just like anything else, just like the advent of, uh, of a food processor, um, y- you have to know when to implement it and when to use it. And there has to be good food coming in and a watchful eye to make sure that good food comes out. The same thing with robotics. Like I just – food is at, at once super, super complicated. It is more complicated than rocket science because rockets don't ripen. <laughs> um and and the moon doesn't decide to develop gluten intolerance uh, at the last minute, but it is also very very uh, lo-fi and very dumb. Um, the the amount of true innovation that you can you can have in food is is pretty narrow compared to other fields because humans can only eat like a few different things. So there's a ceiling on how out there we can get, but uh, I guess this precision is more about how in there we can get yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, how, how much we can command what is already within this realm of, of delicious edible food. And it seems like so much of the innovation is on the cosmetics and the aesthetic of it and not mm-hmm. necessarily on kind of the creation of it. And it sounds like kind of, I, you know, this is an idea I've talked about before on the podcast. It sounds like, you know, I oftentimes draw the analog comparison to, you know, you've seen this great conversion over the past 20 years from, you know, pretty much entirely analog artistic formats to digital and, you know, and and you've seen it in photography and you've seen a lot of the people who are really doing amazing work in digital creation uh, around visual arts. And, and I oftentimes wondered, can we, as we see the digitization of food and cooking, that doesn't necessarily mean like it's all robots. You can actually Mm. create new tools, right. And allow people to kind of explore in new ways. Absolutely. Um, Music didn't end when Bob Dylan picked up a, an electric guitar. Um, uh, the the tenor of the conversation at that time made you think that it might, <laughs> um, but it didn't. Of course, it, it was just another extension of a person's ideas. Um, one of one of my best friends is a photographer and a uh, documentary filmmaker, and he's I think very reasonable about um, the advent of digital photography and how that compares to film. And the limitations and advantages of each medium. And I think a lot of the best photographers are people who have a level head about that and, and realize that it's not that we need to throw away all film and nothing ever needs to touch celluloid again. <laughs> um, there, there may be uses for it. And I think there are still, um, with the sous vide example, the, uh, when, when sous vide cooking first came out, there were people who said, you should never cook a uh, steak filet any other way. This is objectively uh, a better way to cook meat. Everyone should like this. If you don't, you're just uninitiated. And there are times when you want the kind of color gradient of uh, medium rare, uh, medium, medium well, well done, 
as you go out from the center of a traditionally cooked steak. Like my sister won't enjoy a steak that is uh, cooked sous vide, like full medium rare edge to edge. And I, I think that's one of the things that um, is is this uh, like false binary <laughs> with with uh, food and tech often is not only is the tech coming in um, helpful and not meant to rob any of the creative soul from cooking, but it also isn't a one for one replacement of the old stuff. Um, the old stuff is still relevant and the old stuff can still achieve different results. And those different results will always be valid as long as humans disagree on what the best way to cook and eat food is. You know, at the same conference, I actually spoke the day before you did and, and I talked to the, about this idea of, you know, how we can ultimately de- decouple place from, from, from creation in a way. And it mm-hmm. was just kind of speculative. Right. And it was, it may have been a little bit, a little bit, um, in the hollowed grounds of like the CIA, maybe been like, uh, <laughs> hard, harsh for me to say, but, but like I asked, can you kind of recreate like a, what Paul Bocuse might make or a tower Florence, uh, mm. decouple from where, where they are. Right. So, um, as food becomes more digitized, can you, and with higher precision tools, the idea to explore, I wanted to explore was, can you start to think about, okay, can we create interesting food created by these master artists in places where they are not, um, using a creation of, you know, high precision cooking tools, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, place is such a important right. aspect of this stuff. Um, it is also one of the most eye rolly buzzwords when you hear a, when you hear a chef really get a full head of steam talking about the importance of place. Um, it, it very quickly can devolve into, you know, we only cook our turnips under the, uh, first fallen leaves of the <laughs> sycamore that's out, you know, like that, yeah. that kind of stuff can happen pretty quickly, but I think backing it away from that precipice of, of like self parody, um, there are a lot of elements of, of actually the mechanics and the, the psychophysics of flavor that really do hinge on context. And so I think to answer your question in two parts, I think, yes, you could, you could recreate historical recipes. Um, you could get very frankincense and myrrh, um, to a, a point that is very convincing in terms of physical and chemical recreation of what that food might have been or or what that food definitely was. Um, I don't think that you're ever going to be able to recreate the experience yeah. uh, because it's that there's that cliche of the secret ingredient to grandma's cooking is really grandma. That's that's not just uh, fuzzy, warm and fuzzy sentiment. Um, that that is that is actually part of the basis of modern sensory science is that we take cues from our environment, from our current state of health, from our current mindset, the time of day, age, whether you're pregnant or not, like all of these things actually affect either how your sensory machinery works yep. or how your higher order brain processing fits all of those snapshots together. And so, yeah, I, I think you could do um, – you, you could poach guinea hen, guinea hen in a pig's bladder uh, probably better than, than Bocuse could, um, but whether or not – modern sensibilities and yeah. just the the quality of lighting come from, coming from the kinds of fluorescent bulbs we have will uh cause uh, a different impression of that food entirely yeah and there's you know the flavor of the places in the, the ingredients if you go hyper local it's the elevation actually face affects how your taste buds taste things so there mm-hmm. are all these local elements in uh, the context as you said that really impact how you taste things so that that's that is just real that's just the way things yeah. are yeah, and it's it like it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't raise my hackles of saying like why would you unearth these beautiful foodways that are finally at rest or you know whatever like there's no <laughs> I, I'm I have nothing to me is sacrilege in food I think that's ridiculous um, I think it's just those those barriers are the ones um, that would be in the way but I think what's kind of cool about that is there is a little bit of time travel there you know you you can you can bring food from uh, Syria in the 14th century, um, into, uh, modern Paris. And it is a little bit of something unstuck in time where you, you have, uh, it, you know, it's almost like bringing someone from the past to the future and seeing how they would interact with the rules and norms of the day. And I, I think that can also be cool to see how that food bounces around, 
the way we like to cook and eat now. You know, in some of uh, your writing, uh, you've talked about how, you know, flavored flavor-based data points are real now and talked about kind of the advancements of food science. And one mm-hmm. of the big buzzy buzzwords in, in kind of food tech is personalization and hyper-personalization. And <laughs> I'd, I'd love to get your opinion on that. I mean, there's like guys like Pablo Holman, who spoke at my event from one book of my event from one intellectual ventures. And he, he envisions the future of like these vending machines that are instantly pumping out food that are highly tailored towards you with your pharmaceuticals injected in them, making bread mm-hmm. or whatever. And maybe that, maybe that's what we're going to have in 20 years. <laughs> Uh, and, but I, you know, do we, do you see a vis- a, f- a future vision of that or do you see something different? Um, I think I see a little bit more tempered vision of that. Um, I mean, so I, I am wake up every day thankful that I'm not a nutritionist because that field is fraught. <laughs> um, it is super difficult to try to make recommendations on what I should eat versus a 72 year old Thai woman, um, versus even my younger sister. Um, we just have different chemistry and, 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 uh, different metabolisms and so many different things going on. So I, I, on one hand, the science of personalized nutrition is kind of the only approach approach to nutrition that makes sense to me. And I I think a lot of people are, are in agreement with that these days. Um, how that is executed I think gets glossed over and hand waved in 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 a very characteristic kind of signature way that usually indicates that a cook is not talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. When people are like, "Yeah, we'll just inject the right nutrient cocktail into your bao bun right before it's steamed to order and and uh, and presented," um, so it, does, it sounds like te- uh, food is not that all different from tech, where there's a lot of hand waving and buzz buzzwords. What? Yeah, it's it glossing is glossing over. <laughs> that's the, that's the main problem. Is that uh, food tech is now a thing and I, I, I'm not an engineer. I like, I, I don't know how much of the hand waving people actually end up getting away with, but food will check your BS immediately. <laughs> like the second that somebody tastes something, they will spit it out and say, Oh man, no, like cool Ted talk, but that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, um, when, when people talk about 3d printing, Like 3D printing is still a thing. I don't know who started this rumor that 3D printing was going to revolutionize food or work in any way in keeping with like consumer current consumer trends. But 3D printing requires stuff to be these malleable pastes. That's all from paste, basically. That that yeah, that (laughs) cannot adhere to a lot of the physical chemistry that you need to make good food with textural contrast, with taste and aroma, uh, proper taste and aroma release, like. 3D printing is really good for making like cool chevron shaped sugar sculptures and maybe a couple of other things. But anybody who's sitting in an ivory tower saying with 3D printing, we'll be able to print pizza dough has literally never rolled out pizza dough because that is not the yeah. part of the industry that needs to be disrupted. I mean, <laughs> you I know what I mean? Yeah. It's partly like a soil and green, like kind of futuristic mindset that, you know, and it's fairly sure. utilitar- utilitarian that you can kind of get to these places. I do think like where you have like things like paste making food, whether that's chocolate or like kind of these mm. things that are basically started as like mel- kind of malleable forms. It makes sense. And, or sure. like very surface level printing, right? Like there's, you know, these guys making, uh, you know, high, interesting visuals on top of food, but you're right. Like getting like a three course meal with a protein with, with 3d printing, like that's going to be difficult. Yeah. Specifically because of the protein, like proteins yeah. don't play that. <laughs> um, like, uh, 3d printing is excellent for adorning, garnishing, making things pretty working with like pretty much the, the two types of substances that are, that it's really great for, are sugar and chocolate because you've, yeah. you've got um, you've got phase transitions that are built in to work with 3D printing, but exactly like you said, there there is no there is no immediate future where the Jetsons machine that will just crank out like a, a standing rib roast and uh, vegetable side and rice pilaf is even con- is not just conceivable but even worth it because there's so many easier ways to get to that same endpoint that are maybe less sexy but actually would put food on the table. You made the point so a little bit ago that where the rubber hits the road is when you taste something, all the BS stops. Yes. <laughs> and it, that's actually a nice transition for me to 
to talk about fake meat because you and I didn't know you wrote this piece because it was one of my favorite pieces of the last year and I didn't oh, take note take note you. of the author of of the author of the uncanny valley meat like I love first of all the title of that post it's just <laughs> so so true when you're talking about fake meat that's really what it is right is it's it's like are we in the poor express era of like meat alternatives <laughs> or yeah. Or yeah. are we in the like 2018? Like, okay, you can really create a movie that looks like real people era of, of fake, fake pro or kind of alternative proteins. And so that's what I feel like we're still kind of in the Polar Express area. Era. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're still in the Polar Express area. the The funny thing is, I don't know that we'll crack that in our lifetimes. Um, with with food, we may crack it with with video, um, but that's because you don't have to eat video. Um, a convincing, uh, in, in the article, I, I, uh, I use Peter Cushing in, uh, in rogue one, uh, post him posthumously reanimated Peter Cushing as an example where it was like really close, but it was so frustrating and unsettling that it was just like, why did you do that? Yeah. But yeah, um, two to like 2% off on like Peter Cushing is really bothersome. It, like it like, is super bothersome. I, I'd say half a percent off is is unsettling and uncanny and that's that's the thing is it's more uncanny than c-3po who is very clearly not a human but is far enough from being human that we're not instinctively lured in like to get real up close to have empathy with the thing before with that moment where we realize it's it's not quite right and it becomes eerie and and disgusting and uncanny (laughs) um the the deal with video is you only have to fool your visual sense to get that to work, whereas to get uh, a a plant based uh, chicken nugget to feel like a plant based chicken nugget, it has to fool your taste, your sense of touch, your sense of smell, your visual sense, uh, the 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 texture cues that we pick up from uh, sensors in our jawbone that conduct the sound of crunchy squishiness. Uh, to our ears, all of that is going to be compiling and smell testing uh, the the data about the thing that you're eating. And also, we have decades of experience. Every single individual one of us has decades of experience, basically spending all a- all day eating stuff. <laughs> and so, it, I mean, it, it's really it's like the the like back of your hand adage. It's like trying to convince somebody that something is actually the back of their hand. <laughs> is the um, problem is the problem like a, consu- a kind of how you deliver this to consumers and how they should kind of frame it, right? Is it a framing issue in that you know we taste artificial flavors all the time, and so mm-hmm. that artificial popsicle flavor of grape, like I know it's not grape, but I've just gotten used to it because I've grown up with it, right? And it's like the, that fake flavor of Kool Aid and grape I like. It's like American cheese. Like my wife hates it, but I'll, I'll take a slab of Velveeta because I grew up with it, and I was of curious. course. Um, but it's clearly not French cheese. And so um, I've actually gotten to the point where the last couple of impossible burgers I've had, I, I've started to say to myself, I can eat this. This is actually is a suitable substitute, but it's definitely not a hamburger I'll get from like, you know, Red Robin. So yeah. is it like if we – are we just starting all wrong saying, hey, this is a hamburger? Or should we say – I mean, talk a little <laughs> bit about that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's starting all wrong. Like, I, I mean, I will say this. Things like the Impossible Burger are – some some of the greatest achievements in modern food science. Um, I, I just don't know how many more of those we have in the chamber. I, I mean, we as like the the population of people who are making food. Um, like you're you're right. It, it's it's maybe one thing to say this is a really like compared to a Boca burger or you know black bean burger from uh, the early '90s, like. Compared to that, and oh my God, how far have we come? This thing is like yeah. savory and 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 meaty and and fragrant, and it's got so many different things going on. Is it the right move to say uh, this is exactly a hamburger? This is exactly a chicken wing. This is exactly a piece of bacon. I dare you to defy me. I like your your senses are going to win. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think there are especially in in the work that we do with the kind of project briefs that we get there are so many instances where people have like a really amazing thing made out of like lentil puree or something that if they would just come up with a new name and a new context for it would be 
like a sensation, but they insist on saying that it's a uh, ice cream cone, <laughs> you know, right. and, and they insist on telling you this is better than that vanilla bean ice cream that you grew up consuming. Um, and I think that is in this very interesting backwards way of thinking where the reality is that culinary creativity is way cheaper than biotech and marketing. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you want to make good plant-based food, it is way easier to just make eggplants taste incredible than it is to uh, fabricate bacon from the ground up to the point where uh, it, it it becomes indiscernible from uh, real bacon. Um, I think the the second example probably takes a quarter of a billion dollars and may not actually achieve its goal in our lifetime. The former example uh, if you're trying to bring like a plant-based bacon yeah. to the market, um, that isn't trying to be bacon. It's just trying to be like smoky, savory plant that probably takes like a year and, um, a, like a reasonable budget. <laughs> yeah. And you're, tra- you're training in a, you know, kind of sous chefing for a while and then actually just figuring out how to cook. <laughs> you do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's an easy way and there's a hard way. And I think uh, Silicon Valley is a place where people really, not only believe in the hard way, but I think there's kind of a dogma that the hard way is is going to yield the biggest profit at the end of the day, and I don't, I don't see it with food. But it's um, just not it's just not Silicon Valley, right? I mean, you saw um, true. You're seeing all these big companies. Um, there's just another acquisition. Um, Con, maybe it's ConAgra or someone else just this week that bought a kind of an alternative protein. So I feel like there's a little bit of panic going on. I think it's yeah. largely driven by uh, kind of macro trends around kind of eating habits and, and kind of, you know, people looking for, for alternatives and, and just knowing that meat isn't sustainable in the way we're eating meat now. Um, so I, the question is like, and maybe this is more for an economist, but are we kind of in like a, a bubble mentality, kind of like the early 2001, mm-hmm. early 2000s around the dot-com boom? Are we in the meat kind of alternative meat boom <laughs> 1.0 that we're going to see the crash from? Um, I would say yes, but not because of anything specific to meat, but just that food is is so fashionable. And, and I mean that like food is such – it falls prey to so much of the same cyclical trend rise and fall that fashion does that – it, it's really interesting our short sightedness um, in let's let's use um, macronutrient trends as an example. Um, in the late eighties, early nineties, we were convinced that we were all going to drop dead from the ghosts of the baby boomer past of just eating steak and a stick of butter. So fat became uh, the the boogeyman. Um, I mean, fettuccine Alfredo was literally called heart attack on a plate colloquially by almost everybody. Yeah. And, uh, we were constantly on the hunt for, uh, fat free cream cheese, which is just a hilarious oxymoron. We were, we were, um, willing to consume mass quantities of Alestra in potato chips yeah. that just immediately gave everybody gastrointestinal distress. Like you wouldn't yeah. imagine. And we were like, okay, that was a bummer. Now we're back. We're, we got good fats. We're, we're on the move. Let's go now. So then it was uh, you need a uh, uh, whole grains and high fiber carbohydrate diet. And then people realized, oh, maybe the, the whole grain wheat flour that we're eating isn't giving us the nutrition that we thought we were getting. So now we're on to um, this next thing of the protein craze. And I think we're probably a couple years away from a protein backlash happening where people are realizing that eating um, – 700 grams of protein per day for like a 140 pound person may, may have some ill effects, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, completely cutting out carbs or, uh, forcing your body into different metabolic states. Like maybe that's not a good idea. And, and right now the ultimate boogeyman instead of fat is now sugar. And so we are back in a, a scenario where people are eating, mass quantities of, uh, of different non-nutritive sugars that may, may not end up, uh, being too far removed from the Alestra thing. And I bet you, I, 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 I have my like hot take Nostradamus, uh, Vegas odds moment right now is I think by 2020, uh, you will see one or two major food brands on a platform of using quote unquote good sugars. 
whatever that is, yeah. whether whether that is, yeah, we have the same amount of uh, sugar as Coca-Cola, but it's coming from coconut or maple or whatever. I, you're going to see that. People are going to start to mellow out about sugar. There's going to be a little bit of backlash against protein, and then we'll probably move on to being concerned about sodium again before the cycle starts over and we start back with fat. And so but these, and, these and companies – Or at some point, are we yeah. back at Alestra at some point? <laughs> We're back at Alestra. No, truly. And so that's that's the bubble. It's just like – it's a wheel of bubbles. And yeah. Yeah. Um, with with the food that we put out and, and with as much as we can um, help to influence – um, the people that we're working with on developing new CPG food, um, we tr- we try as much as possible to say protein, carbs, fat, sugars, they, they are the building blocks. They are the alphabet. You cannot construct sentences without using letters. Um, and resist the temptation as much as possible to jump onto a trend where you're weeding out one of the like handful of things that we can eat completely and instead focus on – making food with real food because as much as we're we've been terrified of carbs in the past people will still look at a potato with a uh, eternally more favorable light than they will something that they can't pronounce that you use to get around using the carbs in a potato what you are doing i want to switch because you kind of gave me a, another nice segue you keep setting me up here uh, if you <laughs> talked a little bit about the work you're doing and what I think is unique, what I like about what you're doing with pilot R and D and with render is you kind of have this two sides of the coin and that you are kind of getting in there with, with big CPG brands and, and restaurants and saying, Hey, um, you need to, this is how you rethink what you're doing. This is how you do it in a kind of a, an honest culinary way or like an innovative culinary way. Mm-hmm. And you're doing that and you're injecting new thinking into kind of big restaurants, et cetera. But then also like, you know, that there's some crazy concepts that may not some of these guys will never bring to market. So you said, Hey, we'll do that. So you have this other business in render. So talk a little bit about the two businesses. Yeah. So, um, pilot, it's pilot R and D is our first company. And when I say our, um, I formed this company, uh, for, I think we're in our fifth year, um, with, uh, three colleagues of mine, Kyle Connaughton, uh, Dana Peck and Dan Felder. Um, we all came from, this interesting world of uh, restaurant R and D for the handful of crazy restaurants around the world that have the resources and the the bandwidth to have a program like that. So um, places like uh, the Momofuku Restaurant Group, the Fat Duck, um, Thomas Keller Restaurant Group, uh, these these like really amazing, innovative, high profile restaurants that um, and and restaurant groups that have the need for constant innovation and troubleshooting and mindfulness and basically having a food lab. So uh, that was our experience in the past. Um, I also was in the world of food science. Um, I did a, a PhD in food biochem. And so we had this this dual skill set where we had the empathy and the uh, creative insight into working with real food that you only get from uh, being in the kitchen Um uh, somewhere between 10 and 17 hours a day. Um, and we also had the rigid backbone of the scientific method and of understanding of fundamental food science. So we created Pilot as a, a product development company where we would work with uh, packaged food brands. We would work with restaurants, big and small. Uh, we would work with food tech companies on um, troubleshooting and helping them bring new products, new menu concepts, new uh, tech ideas to life in a way that met all of their goals, whether that was we want something that's super clean label or we want something that is uh, as savory as a Dorito uh, but looks different as maybe vegan or you know whatever it might be. We, we help people um, explore ways to execute that that was a little bit more in keeping with the way that human beings like to eat versus like if you go to – if you look at any food product that was created before 2002, the list of ingredients is preposterous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 honestly, uh, in a lot of instances, um, the, that in, that list of ingredients came about because those products were being developed by food scientists who didn't really have insight into what a potato could do, so they didn't think to use it, and instead reached for uh, individual crystalline white powders um, that five of them together comprised that same effect in your souffle or in your ice cream or whatever. Um, 
so that's that's what we do on the pilot side. It's all consulting. Yeah. Um, and on the render side, um, that's our in-house brand. We launched Render um, a year ago as a way to collaborate with our chef friends at all of these amazing restaurants around the country who have plenty of ideas and sometimes honestly have the funding to, to take a stab at launching a food product in the market. But what they will never come close to having is the amount of time that it requires to manage a packaged food product. So uh, was, the there also an, were, was there also an issue you were trying to scratch by saying, hey, we want to do our own products? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, there, there's there's a, a level of uh, of creative flow that we aren't really able to get into working on other people's ideas, which there, there, it it does solve it does scratch a problem solving itch, which is addictive and wonderful. And the plan is to continue to do that at Pilot um, while doing it at Render. Um, but with Render, we do get this like uh, fully opening the valve on on creative juice and. Um, it allowed us to work with, uh, our first product line was with state bird provisions and the progress, uh, here in SF, we made a product called state bird crunch, which is basically like savory clusters of quinoa and like whole spices and seeds and, um, uh, herbs and things like that, um, that we launched at a couple local grocery stores. And now a year later, um, it's in 700 stores all over the U S um, we just launched, uh, six new beverages. So, so three flavors of two different beverage lines, uh, with Courtney Burns and Nick Bala, um, formerly of Bar Tartine that are the kind of non-alcoholic beverages that really creative chefs are doing in their restaurants that you just will absolutely not see in the soda industry or in the kombucha world. <laughs> um, so one is like a savory brine pickle brine based drink. Uh, another is like a sparkling, lightly sweet tonic that we um, formulate with uh, repurposed dairy whey that gives it like body and depth um, without, you know, needing 25 grams of sugar. Um, My favorite so, place to go in the grocery store is basically the drink aisle nowadays, uh, especially oh man, if, you're, that if you're like at a case. Whole Foods or whatever, just yeah, doing that whole case. I'll spend like 10 minutes just staring at it. It's like a bug zapper for humans. It's just like the most alluring, glowy uh, colorful looking, uh, area of the store. And yeah, so, so that's the, these beverages are going in there. And, um, another interesting thing about this render stuff is we, we get to put our money where our mouth is on this notion that engaging with chefy creativity is cheaper and quicker and easier to get differentiated products on the market than trying to reinvent, reinvent the, the wheel whether the wheel is, is uh, a chicken nugget or whether the wheel is vegan ice cream and just making products that don't necessarily have a nutritional imperative. Um, but like the, the state bird crunch ended up having like six, six grams of protein per bag and zero sugar. Not because we were like, all right, we got to make a protein thing, but just that's how much protein is in quinoa and pumpkin seeds. <laughs> you know, just it, chefs, tend towards cooking more wholesome food. And the idea is if we are faithfully uh, adapting these, these products and bringing them in a collaborative way to like retail setting, the food's going to end up being made of stuff that people connect with more in today's food culture anyway. And it's also going to have the advantage of tasting stupid good because that was its only purpose from the beginning. And I think by leveraging chef creations – and, and ideas they've tried out in the restaurant, it's road tested to a certain extent in a different way than it would be if you got together like, you know, you brought in 50 consumer people you got off Craigslist into consumer panel to taste this bag of food. Uh, <laughs> exactly. In a lab uh, and watching them behind pain gla dark glass, they're actually eating this in restaurants. Yeah, they, that is consumer testing. These are the like yeah. the crucibles where there is the most active, steepest learning curve for what consumers will tolerate. You, you can walk into – like you can walk into State Bird here in SF and uh, over the course of an hour meal, you can be like, oh, yeah, uh, mushrooms, butter, and dill pickles is like maybe the food combination I will not stop thinking about ever. <laughs> Whereas if you tried to put – if, if McCormick tried to put out a butter mushroom uh, dill powder – uh, it would fall flat on its face, maybe because of execution, maybe because of the context, maybe because it would take them five years to get that <laughs> churned through 
the scale up process um, and onto the market. But yeah, the idea is we're not like arrogantly assuming that the 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 five of us know what humans should eat. Like I I think that's preposterous to say that there's like one palate um, that's like the genius tastemaker for for America. Um, I think that going to restaurants by the nature of restaurants, you have people from all walks of life. I mean, obviously every restaurant kind of will self sort into, uh, the, the people who can afford it and the people who can't, but within those brackets, there are people from every background, from every country, uh, of every height and weight. <laughs> um, there, there, there's a pretty good cross section of people who love food who come in and out of these restaurants. So if something is successful in one of these restaurants, it's at least worth a deeper look of could this work for the rest of the United States. Hey, well, Ali, this has been a lot of fun talking about robots, uh, fake meat, and <laughs> how you guys are working on doing some really interesting products, both with, I think, big brands as well as your your own products. So uh, how can people find out more about what you're doing? Um, well, you can go to uh, my website. It's just AliBuzari.com. Um, you can catch me on social media where I – say irrelevant, but often colorful things about how food works. Um, and, uh, yeah, go check they, out, uh, they could buy your book too. ingredient, right? They could buy my book, uh, which is on Amazon and wherever good books are sold. Um, or check out the render website where you can order, uh, tasty stuff direct to your house. Uh, and also we have a store locator that shows where all of this crazy stuff, uh, can be purchased in store. Hey, well, thanks so much for spending time with me. Yeah, my pleasure. This was a blast. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Smart Kitchen Show. Check out the Smart Kitchen Summit at smartkitchensummit.com. Find more content at thespoon.tech and make sure to get more Smart Kitchen Shows in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, this is Michael Wolf. Have a great week.